top end of Wales. The Conwy Valley grazing in the sunshine, Conwy Castle in the distance, Colwyn Bay nearby, sea and mountains, the start of our new series of wild tracks. We've many places to see, people to meet, stories to hear. I'll not linger a moment more. From the lazy curving river, I walk tall through the maze of corn to the village of Glen Conwy, once a bustling place of ships and sailormen. In the churchyard, a story of the sea and of heartless men. The grave of a little boy, washed ashore after a steamer sank near Llandidno, the ship's timbers rotten, the captain drunk, the swirling tides scattered the dead along the coast. He was the son of John Tarry, the agent to Lord Derby, who was on the Rothsay Castle with his family, his daughters, his wife and the little son. Um, John Tarry and his daughters are buried in Beaumaris. His wife, Alice Tarry, is buried in Sidner's Church on the Great Orme. And the little lad, John, is buried in Clan Conway here. Not far from the river lived Captain Robert Jones. He was lost at sea off the Menai Strait with all his men, shipwrecked within sight of the lighthouse. Upon these rocks, the legend says, St Bridget landed, floating from Ireland on a piece of turf, emerald green. But a chapel was founded here in the 6th century, a Christian handhold. In this district, in the year 1790, two boys were born, both destined to flower as famous artists. One was Hugh Hughes, whose portraits gave the Welsh a distinctive face. This house, Mediant, was his family home. A man of strong convictions, he was passionate in religious and political argument, and as cartoonist and portrait painter, forthright and honest. His masterpiece was this book, The Beauties of Cambria. And it was from this house in 1819 and 1820 that he walked all over Wales to make his drawings. And here too, he labored to produce the engravings that demonstrate the genius of a national artist of Wales. Over the hill and a lovely meadow walk to the hamlet of Grieg, boyhood home of the sculptor John Gibson. He left Wales for Italy in single-minded pursuit of artistic beauty. He was enchanted by Rome and its classical tradition and spent the rest of his life there. In the fullness of his fame, he was admired by many as the greatest sculptor in the world. Rich patrons came to his studio and he was commissioned by Queen Victoria to carve that icon of the British Empire, a statue of her glorious self. He died wealthy. Hugh Hughes, on the other hand, published political cartoons, putting a coal scuttle on the head of the English Education Commissioner in Wales. He died in poverty. In Grieg, in Salem Baptist Chapel, I find the grave of Anne Evans. Her husband said, renounce your Baptist belief. She refused. He killed her. I ponder that emotional storm as I climb the hill. From the ridge, the lovely prospect of Daganwy, which on this sunny morning looks like a postcard sent from Italy, wishing I were there. An easy walk now to the hamlet of Brina Mine and its curious story. The church rises on a hilltop. In 1890 this was bare farmland until bought by a local woman, Eleanor Jones, who'd been born in poverty and promised that if ever she grew rich, she'd build a village here and an imposing church. Now this church is an amazing building because it seats 200, 250 people in a hamlet of what was then only about four homes. And so because of its sheer scale, the Bishop of St Asaph 
who was also Archbishop, described it as the Cathedral of the Hills when he consecrated it in 1899. The formidable Eleanor Jones was 69 when the work started and she kept a critical eye on every stage of the building. The cottage where she was born, the seventh daughter. As a child, she gathered rushes to make candles to trade for bread. At 14, she went to work as a housemaid. She became the servant of a family in Old Colwyn and she married the son of that family, Charles Frost. The Frost family made their money in the uh, rope and cable industry and they were responsible for the cable on which Charles Blondin crossed the Niagara Falls in 1859. Eleanor's husband died and was buried in the churchyard. The church was completed and Eleanor built a handsome vicarage. But she died four years after her initials and her husband's were carved above the door. She'd built the church, but the dream of a complete village died with her. In Brynamine, the public phone in a private garden. This used to be the post office, and when it closed, the phone remained as if it couldn't bear to go away. A winding lane and a lovely valley that seems to be a secret. I come around the hills in search of a place that once made people shudder, a battleground between good and evil. Seeing Llanelian today, so benign and charming, you'd never imagine it was once the terror of Wales, that over its gentle meadows there was once a place of voodoo. I pause for a potion. I'm looking for St. Eileen's Well, the old notorious cursing well which attracted people with twisted minds and scores to settle. Jane Beckerman's family have owned the well for three generations. Down in the dell, I lift the lid on black magic and discover how it all worked. You had to give the initials of the person that you wanted to be cursed to the keeper of the well who would scratch them on a piece of slate or a stone. And then when the financial transaction had taken place, because this cost as much as 15 shillings in 1822, um, you and the keeper of the well would walk down to the well itself where the ceremony of cursing would take place. The well lay concealed in a grove of trees one of which still stands, gnarled and blasted, the witness of sorcery and of the trade in fear. People were literally in fear of their lives. Uh, people who found out that they had been cursed uh, came here hot foot to have their curse removed, which they could do for the payment of a, again, really rather a substantial sum. I think from the records it shows that it was more expensive to have the curse taken off than it was to put it on. There is evidence to show that uh, in the early part of the 19th century when Methodism was becoming established here, the Methodist chapel that's been built just across the road from the well was sited there specifically in order to counteract the influence of the well and um, there is documentation to show that the tenant farmer who lived in Kevener Funon at the time and the local church people and the local Methodists all got together, built the Methodist chapel and then came and as a group smashed the well house to the ground and tried to eradicate all the physical sources of the well. They tried to, they pulled down the gateway, they smashed up the path leading to the well to try to stop people coming here. But it didn't stop them. People continued to come here for uh, almost perhaps a hundred years after that happened. And in my grandfather's lifetime, in 1966, people were coming here until he had this particular well re-consecrated um, with the help of the local priest in the village of Llanelian. The old shadows are chased away. I close the lid carefully on mischief and superstition. Close it tight. Around the edges of old Colwyn, I'm on the trail of a tragedy. This is a story of Wales and Africa, of an idealistic Welsh Baptist missionary who in 1882 sailed for the Congo in the deep heart of Africa. 
and who met and recruited some young men. One of them was a slave called Nkanza. There are other graves of Africans who died here far from home. Emmanuel Abraham, the biblical name of a man whose parents called him Kabuna, and the faded inscriptions which mark the burials of Kinkasa and Samba. These are the graves of African students who were invited over to Colwyn Bay by a man called William Hughes, who went out to the Congo in 1882 to act as a missionary for the Baptists. And while he was over in the Congo, he was rather disgusted by the attitude of his fellow Baptists, who he thought were very racist, really, had no thought or consideration for the Africans or their views. His answer was to found Congo House, to train African missionaries for Africa. It opened in 1890, and for 20 years Congo boys came to Colwyn to learn the Bible and practical skills like printing and tailoring. Not everyone was as pleased to see the Africans in Colwyn Bay and mixing with polite society as William Hughes. And in 1911, a terrible scandal sheet called John Bull magazine wrote this awful story, xenophobic and racist, attacking William and the Institute, accused him of promoting promiscuity between the Africans and polite white ladies, and accused William of ripping off money from the Institute. And this destroyed him, really. The Institute closed down, the Africans were sent back to Africa, and William ended up in complete poverty and disgrace, and he died in Conway Workhouse, and he was buried here. The tragedy is for the four boys who lie here, Nkanza, Samba, Kinkasa, and Kabuna Budu, who left home with such great hopes for their homeland, and through accidents and illness, they died in Colwyn Bay, and never returned to see Africa again. Dogged, that's the only way to be on the long haul towards Thisvain. A gull's eye view of Colwyn Bay, famous for its mild winter climate. And on the way, Pay Lewis Farmhouse, 17th century, witness to an episode in a stirring British drama. The great front door, made of oak and built to stop a musket ball. The initials of Thomas Vaughan and his wife Elizabeth, picked out in iron studs, and the date, 1659, a desperate year in North Wales. Echoes of the Civil War, Oliver Cromwell was dead, and in Wrexham Market, Sir Thomas Middleton unsheathed his sword and declared Charles II was now king. Others rallied to join the rebellion, and there was fighting around this farmhouse. They say that the original front door was smashed in that fighting. In any case, the revolt was put down. Charles II had to wait to reclaim his kingdom. On top of Manith Marion, I build up my qualifications to be a chief inspector of views, a master of meandering. Above the artistic tractor, the old signal station, semaphore in those days, messages from Hollyhead telling Liverpool merchants their ships were coming in and their fortunes. Into Thlisvine to call upon its Celtic saint, who, like any self-respecting holy man, gave birth to a legend. That's St. Cunvran to whom the church is dedicated. He was the patron saint of uh, horned cattle. People used to bring their cattle here and make offerings to him in the Middle Ages. And uh, that's why he's got his tongue hanging down his chin, like a, a cow licking a sore place. Near the church, the saint's well, a star attraction on the pilgrim trail in the Middle Ages, and then forgotten. Now, being unearthed by local history fans. What do you expect to find here? Well, we've no idea really with the age of it. I mean, obviously at this level, it's, uh, it's the plastic bag level. Um, but as we get further down, we have to get the 
County archaeologist in. Uh, who knows? I mean, it's, it's over a thousand years old, so it could be anything. How deep do you think you'll have to dig? We've put a metal bar down in the middle, and we think it's approximately another four foot, five foot to go, something like that. Well, I won't disturb you. Okay. Dig for victory. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Very much. Bye. Bye. From one hole in the ground to another, slammed the last quarry, and then down to the caravan coast. I meet an old railway hand who's to show me a piece of railway history hidden away. At the height of the Victorian railway age, this was a place of horror. At that time, the worst railway crash of all, the Abigaile disaster. A footnote in history now, but the memory of it has not been allowed to wither. There were two trains involved. The Irish Mail, which runs between Euston and Holyhead, uh, was the passenger train that was involved. And there was also a goods train as well. This had left Chester and on its way down to here it had picked up some wagons of paraffin. The two trains met roughly about here and the collision was absolutely catastrophic. The paraffin in the wagons was catapulted over the top of the uh, train, the locomotive of the, uh, the Irish Mail, and drenched the first few coaches in paraffin. They immediately caught fire and unfortunately the 33 passengers that were killed were in those leading coaches. It's interesting, isn't it, that all this happened more than 130 years ago, yet the memorial has been maintained all that time and there are flowers here and so on. That's right, yes. There's been a tradition with the railway companies always to maintain it over the years and the residents of the nearby caravan site, they occasionally come here and put flowers on the memorial as you can see here today. Sluiced by the tide and shiny, the shore is a perfect walk. I've made an appointment to see Dennis Rogers and Ted James, who years ago used to catch conger eels in these rocks. Rather to their surprise, they've cornered a conger today, the first they've seen in years. Good morning, what's going here? Good morning, Dennis. He is. He is big. Catching one is not for the sensitive. This evening he'll be a fish dinner cut into steaks and fried in butter. But how many people but do this now? Oh, oh not many. No, not many now. You're the last of the conga Yes, prob yeah, probably, yes, be, yeah. yes. But when you were boys, did a lot of people do it? Yes, yes the old quarry men used yeah. to, you know, the old quarry men used to come down and catch them, like, you know, so we followed their footsteps. Yeah. I've, we've seen them bigger than this, haven't we, Dennis? Yeah, this one bigger, yeah. Hmm. Years ago, but this, this is yeah. not bad, like, oh, not bad, not yeah. bad at all. It's, it's quite a big yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You'll eat it all yourselves? Oh, oh no, no, no. Give it away, yeah. Will you? Yes. Yeah. Looking up from the shore, I can see a house in Llanvilas with a place in comic literature. It used to be a boys' school, Arnold House, and it was here that a young and hopeful writer came to be a teacher. The main interest of the house, obviously, to a lot of people, is the fact that the famous novelist Evelyn Waugh was uh, present here in the 1920s. I think it was 1925 or 1926 desperately unhappy. He really hated being here, hated being a schoolmaster, hated the, some of the other schoolmasters, uh, thought the building was uh, dark and gloomy and he was also having a bit of romantic problems at the time. Rejected by his sweetheart and sunk in gloom, Evelyn Waugh waded into the sea to end it all. But a jellyfish stung him and drove him back, or so he wrote. As for the school and its monstrous headmaster, they appeared in the classic Decline and Fall. In that novel, 
he gave the school some battlements, no doubt borrowed from the nearby Gothic pile, Griech Castle. The wall has four plaques, each telling of a glorious incident. The first plaque celebrates a Welsh victory in a battle against the English. Another Welsh triumph, this time against the Normans. And number three tells of a battle between Henry II and Owain Gwynedd. A Welsh victory, of course. Stirring stuff, but all the stories are fantasies. Only the fourth plaque tells a true tale, that Richard II was taken prisoner here. The expert on all this is a schoolboy, who loves the castle and has written about it, and discussed it with a couple of chaps he's met. The schoolboy sleuth has found the truth. Yes, um, the towers were built in, eight, in the 1820s by Lloyd Hesketh, Bamford Hesketh of Greer Castle, and he has a, a lot of interest in local Welsh history. And as if you visited Greer Castle in the 1820s, you would have seen his collection of like memorabilia of the past. He had carved heads of gods and goddesses of the Druids from Anglesey, and he had um, in all of his windows his Welsh heritage displayed, which is in the stained glass, which he designed himself as well. So these stories were really just to add a bit of glamour and colour? Yes, yeah. They were just to promote local interest, really, in their heritage, and, which was a good thing, really, so... Didn't matter too much that they weren't entirely true? No, they were legends. They were just legends. Finally, a small and, I think, delicious piece of history. In that house lived Sir Alfred Jones, a Victorian shipping tycoon who, in 1884, introduced into Britain an exotic novelty, the banana. Thanks to his initiative, the British fruit bowl was changed forever. Mm -hmm.